I purchased a new Genie 6072 series wall mount garage door opener for my newly built garage. Then I filmed this video over the course of almost two months so I could not only provide notes and tips on the installation, but I can also give you a good review of the unit after using it for a few weeks. So stick around and see how I liked it. Yeah, so the model I'm installing is this Genie jack shaft wall mount unit, and it is 6072HBO. When I was looking at this, there was four permutations of the unit here. There was a base model unit. There was one with Wi-Fi capability, which I think just allowed you to open it from your phone. There was one with a battery backup option where if the power goes out, you're still able to lift the door up. And I believe that is a requirement in California and maybe some other states. And then there was one with both the Wi-Fi and the backup unit. So that, there's four per permutations of that. I'll probably have an Amazon link to the base model one. This one happens to be the one with the battery backup. And the only reason I got that is because it was on sale. That particular model was on sale and it actually was cheaper than the unit that didn't have it at the time. But I'll put a link to the base model unit, and if you live in California or in a state that requires battery backup or you have power outage issues, I would recommend getting that battery backup. Or if you want the Wi-Fi or whatever, uh, you, can, you can then link to, there's links to the other uh, model options there. Well, as you can see, I've already done a little bit of the installation off the camera, but I'll explain. I didn't really do all that much. First of all, you'll notice that the way the jack shaft unit works obviously is by tying it's this little you know the the motor uh, shaft to your sh the shaft of your you know your pulley sh your spring shaft your pulley shaft I don't know what that the name of that really is and it's got this collar here so whether you mount it on the left or the right you would put the collar on the side and then you bolt the collar both to the spring shaft and to the unit itself uh, so I've already done that. I've already tightened the, there's, there's three, three sets of two bolts all the way around. You want to tighten them up nice and even and don't go too hard on it because you don't want to like press in your, sh the shaft or anything. You just want it to hold real tight. So that's about it. Now the other thing I did was for fr framing wise, your garage door might not have great framing up on this area here. I added this, this thing in here. I sistered it in and one of the reasons is because I noticed the, the garage door installer, he didn't have this, this piece here. What he did was he was just barely off of his stud, so he took this bolt and he just angled it in. It didn't look the greatest. So I put this piece in here and I sistered it in. That way it has a more meat of uh, the wood to uh, attach this bolt to. But also it comes down here because the one other point of attachment to this thing is this little L bracket here. And so that is also bolted into my new stud and then it's bolted onto the unit. Notice that you can slide it a little bit because I put a level on it and this is before I even read the instructions. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just guessing. So I made sure this was level and plumb and, it, and it's mounted uh, nice and solidly. Thus far, the installation is actually much easier on these wall-mounted units than they are on the chain drive type units that uh, I used to have. I turned this to page 8 of the instructions, and the first thing really for as far as adjustment is concerned is adjusting the drum selection. What does that mean? Well, it says here that the drum selection pro programmed at the factory is for a 4-inch standard lift style drum. but you may have a different size drum on yours depending on you know whether it was a high lift or not. If you haven't been following my videos on this garage build series, uh, you may not know this, but my door is a high lift, does have the high lift setup on it. The way you can tell that is normally at the top of the garage, so here's where my trim is and that's the top of the door, usually that's when you start seeing your angle come up and around and that's that would be a standard lift. Notice on the high lift it has this additional bracketing right here 
which lifts that angle up. And typically on a high lift setup, I have a 12 foot ceiling and this is an eight foot tall garage. But typically with high lifts, unless you do something really custom, this standard high lift is about 30 inches or about two and a half feet. And that's what I have. So this raises it from eight feet to about 10 and a half feet. And so that is all that high lift stuff. Now, with regard to the drum, this is what I'm going to have to measure. And I'm pretty sure what they're looking at is probably this measurement here. So I'm going to go ahead and get that. I'm, I'm imagining this is probably four. This would be like the standard. But this is probably, I don't know, maybe six. So I'm going to go ahead and measure that and take a look at that. But I think the drum, this is the drum that they're talking about. And the reason they need to know that, and so you can program that, that size in, is because it, that will affect how fast or slow it needs to crank based on that drum size. Well, I measured, I really didn't have to measure this drum, but as you can imagine, this is the four inch, but on the outs, by the outside, it, that, that's actually lifting it, that's six inch. So really that's the setting right there. So basically, there's only, I think there's only two settings. I haven't really done it yet, but there's the standard four inch or less drum or the greater than four inch drum. So all I need to do is set it on the greater one that's made for those. And basically you just follow the instructions here. When you lift up the panel, you'll just be using these up and down arrows and these, these little, this little keypad here and looking for the proper blinking lights um, you know, red and purple LEDs and the long blinks to determine whether you've made the setting properly. Obviously, in order to do this, and the other thing I didn't show you is I do have a, it plugged into a 110 volt outlet. This is a, wired to a pretty much dedicated 15 amp circuit. The only thing I also have on it is a, is a little, you know, 14 watt LED light. But other than that, this is a pretty much a dedicated 15 amp circuit for the garage door opener unit. So I'm going to go ahead and program that first setting in and we'll go from there. Okay, now that I've set the drum selection to the purple, I can now move on to the next programming option, which is the down limit. Now the down limit is not unique to a jack shaft or wall mount unit versus a track style chain drive unit. They both need to kind of have a, some similar setting to this. What the down limit is, is where it needs to stop when we know we're at the floor. Because uh, otherwise, the garage door opener would keep cranking even when the garage door is at the floor, which could damage the seal on the garage door or the garage door itself or the unit by stressing it out by, by you know, having the motor force against the uh, floor. So it's a very important setting, this down limit. So I'm going to go ahead and read about that. Now, I, I already have used uh, utilized this because after I installed the unit, I, I have it set right now to where that rope right there is pulled so that I can, right now the opener is not engaged, so I can freely open the garage door. So what I've been doing is using a little white rope down there and, and just from the outside, just yanking it up and basically manually raising the unit. So what it says to do, since I have the it currently pulled down to where the unit is unengaged, what it says though, as a warning, to engage, you want to engage the door of the opener. So we want to pull the cable and release to engage the uh, opener. But in real bold print, it says, do not start with the door fully open or closed. So what I need to do is jump down off my scaffold and uh, open the door partially so that I can engage the unit here and complete that setting. All right, now that I have it opened and propped up a couple feet, let me just try to release the cable so that the unit is engaged. There it goes. It's gotta make a click. Now that I've got that to engage, the garage door opener should be holding on to that jack shaft there. And so I should be able to pull this stuff out and then I can program where the ground is so that it knows where to stop. So I'm gonna go ahead and climb back down, pull that stuff out, climb back up and follow these instructions, which is basically 
to uh, you know use those buttons on the front there to set which program function I'm trying to do, which is the down limit. And then using the up and down buttons, apparently that should be able to adjust the travel. So another way I could have the door go down, 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 down. And basically what it says is you just manually go, program it downward, uh, whether they say until you see that the bottom of the door, the seal is compressed. There's a little black seal on the bottom of your door or gray seal. And you want the door to be touching the floor and that seal to be a little bit compressed, but that's it. You don't want the, the, the actual uh, steel of the door to be like jammed against the concrete. You want a little bit of a, a space where that seal should take up the gap. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now and get that programmed. All right, well, I held the down arrow for two and a half seconds. The main LED is blinking blue. Now, apparently, I can just hit one of these buttons and the garage door should respond, which it is. Notice I'm going down. I've also obviously removed my little contraption to set it up, so I'm just going to lower the garage door very slowly. And because of how high I'm up, I've got to get up and down off the scaffolding. But like I said, I'm going to check to see where the bottom should be. Like I said, I don't want to see any light, but I don't, also don't want the door pressed hard against the concrete. I want that seal to have a little bit of spring to it, but the light should go away. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Once I am happy with it, I'll climb back out my scaffolding, and then I'll, all I have to do is hit the program set button, and that should lock it in. So now that I've programmed the up limit, I'm kind of at the end of what I can do based on my current installation, which is just having the opener installed on the shaft and it plugged in. In order to do the rest of the programming for the you know profiles and for the remotes, I need to have the, the rest of the installation done. All right, well, I have now installed on the installation instructions going back and forth here, the safety beams, which are just the sensors at the bottom. I don't know why they named them safety beams, but basically all that entailed was grabbing the spool of this two-strand white wire and attaching these to the wood right here that said between five and no more higher than five to six inches. So this is about five, that's fine. And one sensor goes on this side. I just did the green one with the green LED, put the wires on. I don't know if it matters, but I made sure that the striped wire was on the front side and the solid white was on the inside. Same thing on the left side, this one happens to have a uh, red LED, one's this receiver and transmitter. Same thing, um, the striped wire on the outside, the solid white on the inside. Stapled the wire, ran it all the way up, ran it all the way over. And then same thing, this one went straight up. Both wires get plugged into the STB or safety beam holes there. And basically the way you do that is a little bit interesting is that you take a little screwdriver, in this case my little thermostat screwdriver, and you poke it in a little slot there under the thing and then you can, you, I twisted those, the, the same color wires together, white with white and the stripe with striped, and then use the screwdriver to push in there and that lets you force the wire into the hole and it catches it and holds it there. So that's what I did, and now I'm able to completely test the remote so we can go and go down. Not sure why it shuttered like. And go all the way down. And I might have to get this cord out of the way, otherwise it interrupts. I will interrupts the, um, the safety switches there. But notice how it closes nice and gingerly, doesn't slam onto the ground, and then we'll go back up. I'll hold the rope up so it doesn't interrupt the safety sensors. 
And of course this rope will just be untied and removed once I know garage door opener is functioning. Let's see if it stops at my top limit, which is just above the cross member. And there it is. Stops right on the dime. So now we've got our up and down limit uh, established. Now we can kind of just finish off the rest of the instructions. Now if you're wondering why I'm jumping back and forth between configuration and the installation, because I think normally what people would do is finish the installation instructions, which includes the cable keepers, the door lock kit, the safety beams, the, the uh, light, the Bluetooth light, and everything else. And then they would start on the configuration instructions. The reason I did it this way, and you don't have to do it my way, but this is just the way I did it, was I just started with step one and got the overall unit mounted, you know, with the sleeve on the shaft, and it secured up where it needed to be, plugged it in, and then, like I said, I started, I started with the down limit instructions or the configuration. Now, why I did that, and obviously, uh, either the up or down limit, you can't test it on the remotes because the remotes won't work unless those sensors, the safety beams or whatever they call them, are installed. But what it allowed me to do is once I powered this up and set the up and down limit without installing anything else, it allowed me to do that, but it also did one more important thing, is it verified to me that the motor is actually working. Because what would really stink is if I went through all these instructions, got all the wiring done, everything done, and I find out I have a defective unit. And then I've got to go, go remove it all and pack it all back up. But just by doing step one and doing those up and down limits, allow me to verify yet that yes, overall the motor seems to be working fine, so we can move forward. Then I wanted to make sure the remote's working fine. Well, I had to do this, the safety beam step, so I skipped over to this step, step seven here just to get those installed, and then that allowed me to test and program the remotes. Now that I know the remotes work and the overall operation of the system works, now I can just go back and fill in the pieces that I, for, that I didn't do, which is the cable keeper and the door lock kit and, and just and, and any, anything else in the instructions, I can just uh, finish and verify. So anyway, that's why I did it, is just to make sure that I had a working unit before I got way into uh, the installation and realized that. Okay, so it's been about six weeks, maybe even almost two months, since my last clip and I wanted to leave a little bit of gap in the middle of this video for kind of like a part two here where I can kind of give it a quick review of how much I've liked it over the past six weeks. And as you can see, this looks like a totally different garage now. I have drywall and wallboard and paint. I've got the unit actually finished or I've completed the install on the unit as well as even a, a new epoxy floor. And if you want to find out more about how I did all that stuff, just check out the Garage Rebuild playlist on my channel. But I'm going to give you a quick review and rundown of what I like and dislike about it now that I've been using it for almost two months. Okay, first off in the review, and it's, this is a pretty obvious thing here, is I love the unit. It's quiet, it's smooth, and it's very compact and out of the way. That's why I bought it, so that, there's nothing new about that. Um, the first thing I noticed about the unit that was odd to me is this effect here. You notice it stutters at the top of the travel when it's about to go down. What I read about this unit is that is actually completely normal and on purpose. I think what happens in I'm not an expert on garage doors, but I think when the garage door is at the top of its travel, I think the spring is compressed at the most, and I think maybe that's mostly where it could fail or slip, in which case, if you tried to take the door down, the garage door opener might not be expecting that kind of weight and might fail or be a safety issue. So I believe what that stuttering is, is it's built into the unit to try to do a torque test before it's, it says it's safe to lower the door. That's my guess, but it is on purpose and it's not a defect. One of the other things I really like about this is these T-bar sensors. Now, they're not unique, every garage door opener has them, but what I like is these lights. This side has a red LED light and the other one has a green LED light. 
But one of the things I hated about my craftsman unit is when I didn't have these things lined up properly, the only way to find out is by trial and error and trying to up lower or uh, raise the door and finding out that it wouldn't. Uh, with these, you don't have to guess because when you block, it starts blinking and you know that they're connecting when it's not blinking. So I don't have to wonder what's happening and or why my garage door is not going down or whether those sensors are making contact anymore. I really like that feature. The other thing I like about it is that light. It's good 1200 lumen, I believe, LED light. When it's completely dark in here, even though I have it in the corner, that literally lights up the whole garage. I mean, not super bright, but if I'm getting out of my car anywhere in the garage, I can see my way, and my reason for putting it in this corner here was obviously so I could see my way to the switch to operate the main lights of the garage. But this does a pretty good job. And finally, the thing I like about the inside wall mount opener is that it's wireless. And the, my Craftsman one had to have that two wire. And if that was the case, I would have to run two wires from this 30 feet or more all the way to cross to the other side of my garage. That would be a pain. So I'm glad this is wireless. Now, one of the cons of this unit that I have is that it only came with this remote and that. Um, my Craftsman unit had a keypad that I really used a lot because this is a detached garage. You know, if I forget to open it from inside, it'd be nice to just hit, hit the keypad and uh, be able to open it there. You can't buy the add-on for that, and I likely will. Yeah, about $75 I can add on another remote and, and the keypad, just like I have with my Craftsman unit. One of the things I dislike about this is that it tends not to respond. Sometimes I have to hit it one, two, maybe three times before it responds. I don't know if that's a wireless thing or just the buttons are a little bit janky, but yeah, that's not the best. My Craftsman unit had, and this, this just has kind of these rubberized buttons. My Craftsman unit had this clicky type thing, and I kind of like that positive click, you know, and, and, and it opened every time. So maybe that's partly due to the wireless and on that maybe range, although I think the range on this was 50 feet, and I'm nowhere near that. I'm more like 30, so I don't know, uh, but that's one thing that's a bit of annoyance. So that is pretty much the review for right now. I'm really more concerned about the longevity and whether or not this thing uh, gives me any trouble for a long time, but so far I really like it. It's easier to install and in almost every way it's better than my chain drive unit. So I, I probably would never go back to a chain drive unit after this. Well now onto the instructions. I've been running with it for the past few weeks fully installed. The last part of my video I only had the safety beam sensors and the unit itself installed and configured. I did install the door lock kit. That was pretty so, uh, pretty straightforward to do. Now I was hoping that I could use, you know, the existing knockouts and holes pattern, the hole pattern on my uh, rail, but that did not line up or work at all. So I had to drill all no new holes for it. Plus it's too high up, right? You want to install this to where the pin coming out here to block, to block the wheel is just, you know, within a couple inches of the wheel. That way if someone tries to jimmy your door up, they can only go up about an inch and a half and they can't get, get up and under there to, to, to steal anything. Had I put it up here, that would have given them eight inches. They could probably have gotten, gotten underneath it. I do suggest uh, taking that sticker off the back of the instructions. It gives you the whole pattern. You just stick it onto the back here like I did and then drill from the outside in. And I would also suggest making this hole wider than they recommended just because you don't want any binding on here. You want that to be nice and smooth and there's no, there's no downside to making that hole just a little bit wider. The light is pretty self-explanatory. One thing that the instructions don't tell you is there's a tab on the face of it. You can open off the cover of it and drive your screws in from inside. That made it a lot easier to install rather than having to drive your screws in and kind of like twist the unit onto it. You know, that twist style kind of pan head screw type thing. But also if you were building your garage brand new and planning out the electrical, you could also make it much more cleaner than mine by putting an outlet into the ceiling like I did, but these are for specifically for my shop lights. You would need a constant power outlet and you could in your ceiling and you could put it completely on 
over that and then you wouldn't have any wires or anything. That would be a lot cleaner way to install it if you could do that. The backup battery, super easy to install. It just kind of bolts onto the bottom. I would suggest making sure your wires have plenty of uh, play in them so that they can go around the back and out. That's a, probably a cleaner look. I kind of just went out the side. That you know works for me. But uh, yeah, I did test this out. I actually did flip the breaker off and was able to fully open the door with that backup battery. And it, it was a little slow, but it absolutely worked. If you are in a state that requires it, uh, maybe suggest picking up an extra one. Uh, you know, who knows how long they'll make them or whether you'll have problems getting one when it, when it finally dies. I don't really care too much about it, but that may be something you consider just picking up an extra one, having a spare backup battery on hand. The one issue I had was with the cable keepers. This side installed pretty well. Notice I have about an inch of gap here, and I just installed the cable keeper a little bit higher than it suggested, but the reason I can get away with that is because at the top of the travel, the bottom of my door, because of the extended lift, never really gets horizontal. It only tips a little bit this way and it still say, stays mostly vertical. So I never, what I suggest doing, the instructions don't tell you to do that, is put the door up at the top first and just see where you're mounting it, how far back this, the, there, there can't be too much travel here. Uh, if the door is like cocked horizontally, this might pull back or break off. So you really wanna just make sure you know where you're gonna put it uh, by looking at the door at, at the top limit. Okay, so where where this went wrong on this side, notice I don't have it connected at all. In fact, I just bent it and kind of kept it out of my way. Instead of this being back here and straight and on here, notice I have a lot less gap right here. So the garage door installer just didn't have the same amount of gap. That's all there is to it. It's just a little bit off. Well, it bent it and prevented the door from opening, which I guess is what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to make sure that that cable has the proper amount of gap. There's no binding in here, you know, uh, between the door and the rails, and just to make sure that uh, it doesn't put stress on the unit because if, the, if one of the rollers fell off and the door bound into the thing, that, that would, uh, you know, prevent the door from, it would stop the door from continuing to try to open. They gave you spacers, right, to put in here, in this wheel. And maybe I'll try them again, but they didn't seem to do anything to prevent that gap from getting a little bit too narrow and, and not allowing the door to open. But, um, so I may try it again, especially on this bottom one where it would be more critical. Those spacers didn't do anything. They, they, they just don't work with, with something like this. Maybe I can find something else that'll, that'll work, uh, some wider spacers or make some Teflon thing for myself. But for right now, I have it disconnected. So that's just one thing that just didn't quite fit right and, and, and go right. And I don't really know how much value that cable keeper really is. Uh, obviously, it does prevent some issues, but in the event that there is a problem with the door or the cable, but I don't know how really necessary it really is. Well, that wraps up my review and installation. If you have any questions for me, just leave a comment and I'll get back to you soon. The link to the product is in the video description and please consider subscribing to my channel if you like to see interesting home DIY, auto restoration, or even electric car conversion projects. Take care.